A drag story time targeted by a bomb threat. Tonight on the rundown, the bar owner received even more threats. How he's responding to this rise in hate. Plus, only on four, the new type of first responders joining the D.C. Police Department. They won't have guns or badges, but they will help D.C. Police respond to emergencies. News 4's Mark Seagraves introduces us to these community safety ambassadors. And getting their flowers decades after their important role in World War II. I'm overwhelmed with the attention that we're getting after 80 years. <laughs> How these women, better known as Rosie the Riveter, broke barriers for generations to come. You're watching the News 4 Rundown. I cannot wait to see that story. It's a good one. Thanks for joining us for the News 4 Rundown. Our newscast streaming for you. I'm Tommy McFly. I'm Sean Yancey. It is Friday, April 12th. We begin now with a look at our top stories. The 16-year-old accused of shooting and killing a 14-year-old on a Metro platform faced a judge today. Police say he shot 8th grader Avion Evans last Thursday inside the Brooklyn Metro station. Today in court, the judge ordered the suspected shooter held until his trial May 24th. He will also receive a psychiatric evaluation prior to trial. Prince George's County Police released these photos of the suspects involved in killing a trash removal employee. This happened on Greenvale Parkway in Woodlawn last week. The suspects were pictured getting out of what appears to be a gray Kia sedan before shooting 30-year-old Idogan Gesset you dozen from Atlanta, Maryland. Detectives are still trying to determine the, na the nature and the motive of this, but they say it was not a random crime. The three and six-year-old boys injured in a house fire in Northern Virginia this week are still in the ICU. The brothers were trapped inside the burning house on Whetstone Manor Court in Clifton. The family shared a post on Facebook that said both boys uh, had a small episode this morning with their sodium and oxygen levels, but they are trending positive again. The family asked for continued prayers. Today, the Biden administration announced another round of student loan cancellations, this time totaling $7.4 billion for more than 270,000 borrowers. The Education Department says more students will become eligible for forgiveness under the SAVE plan as they hit their 10 years of payment mark. Others will qualify through the income-driven replacement repayment plans and the public service loans forgiveness plan. And now to a developing story tonight. A place of health, wellness, and community became a crime scene last night. A man was shot and critically injured after a fight on a basketball court. It happened inside the LA Fitness near Woodmore Town Center in Glen Arden. That's where we find News 4's Dominic Moody with the latest on the investigation. Images show the scene outside the LA Fitness near the Woodmore Town Center, minutes after a shooting inside on the basketball court. Glen Arden and Prince George's County Police say the shooting stemmed from a fight between two men inside the gym. Police say the victim was shot multiple times. Someone's bringing a gun to a gym is out this world because you're supposed to be lifting weights, not lifting guns. Deontay goes to the gym regularly. He, along with others, are still processing what happened. This is a really nice, calm area for the most part, so I was shocked. You know, you can't even go to the gym and, you know, and just, that's, where, that's your free space, you know what I mean? And, and you can't even, you know, work out in peace. It's, it's really, it's really upsetting. Police say the victim was taken to the hospital where he remains in critical condition. Investigators say the suspect drove away from the gym in an unidentified white vehicle. To have someone pull a gun, that guy was sick. Detectives say multiple people witnessed the shooting. Today, signs on the front door read, LA Fitness is temporarily closed, and members received a similar push alert. Gym regulars say they want to ensure they're entering a safe place to exercise. It's definitely a thought. Like, I have a wife and two kids. You know, I hate to be an innocent bystander or something crazy from going to the gym. I think that they have to change their policy on, on bringing in, allowing people to bring in two guests. And because, you know, people that don't even pay for the gym are in here. Prince George's County Police say that if you have any information about the shooting that happened last night, you are asked to contact them. In Prince George's County, Dominique Moody, News 4. News 4 reached out to LA Fitness for comment, and we are still waiting to hear back. Sean? Family is trying to have fun at a popular LGBTQ plus bar in Arlington last weekend became the latest victims in a wave of hateful threats happening across the country. A bomb threat was called in at Freddy's Beach Bar and Restaurant during a drag time story. Uh, story time. News 4's Darcy Spencer spoke with the bar's owner who's also received death threats. 
This is video of drag queen Tara Hoot performing her family fun time at Freddy's Beach Barn restaurant in Arlington last Saturday. A performance that was delayed because of a bomb threat emailed to the bar that forced a temporary evacuation. Freddie Lutz is the owner. Did it strike fear in your heart when you saw this? It's a little unsettling to get an email like that and recent, more recently a threat on my life. Police searched but found nothing. The show went on. Lutz says there was also a threat to his home, his other bar in Rehoboth, and he received a death threat for the first time ever. But it said, we don't care that you're gay. We don't care about your gay bar. We don't ca care that you gay people get together but we want you to stay away from our children. Lutz describes his business as a straight, friendly gay bar that's been here for more than two decades. The drag story time was the first one ever held here. This was a drag queen singing songs and reciting children's books to little kids with rainbows and bubbles. There is no, nothing sexual in this show. A group called the Rainbow Defense Coalition helps defend drag story hours in the DMV. Arlington police and the FBI are now investigating the threats. Somebody gave permission to these people to crawl out of the woodwork and um, the vitriol and the hatred is just something I never. Not only did the threats not stop the show here at Freddy's, the owner says he's planning to do another drag story time on May 4th. Alexa Rodriguez leads Trans Latinx DMV. She says there is a dangerous escalation of threats across the country. I won't be afraid anymore. They won't erase us. They won't do anything against us because we will fight back. As police continue their investigation and added patrols around Freddy's, Lutz is planning the next show, which will focus on love and peace. Darcy Spencer, News 4. Darcy, thank you for that. And it's hard to believe already next week marks three weeks since the bridge collapse in Baltimore. And tonight, crews continue to make progress in cleaning up that wreckage. Crews are hoping to have enough of that bridge removed to open up a larger shipping channel by the end of the month. Now, here are four things to know about the recovery efforts. Maryland's congressional delegation introduced legislation that would guarantee the federal government pays the entire bill to replace the bridge. Meanwhile, the work is underway to remove the wreckage and containers off the Dolly cargo ship. Once that's done, the ship itself can then be moved. The goal is to have normal port operations by the end of May. We spoke with an expert about how long it could take to build a new bridge. We've got a lot of work to do to be able to decide what type of a bridge you're going to put back in that place. Normally, a bridge like this is going to take five to ten years to build. And I think that there's got to be a way wow. for us to be able to expedite that and do it a little bit quicker. Uh, if you'd have to, I think that once the channel gets cleared and things get moving, I think it's very possible you'd be able to get a bridge rebuilt there in two to three years. Crews hope to resume the recovery mission for the bodies of three of the construction workers who died during the collapse once some of that wreckage is removed. Here in the district, soon you'll see a new type of police responder on the streets of D.C. So the D.C. Police Department is launching a new crime initiative and crime fighting team called the Community Safety Ambassadors. And they won't have guns or badges, but they might be the first to show up when you call 911, depending on the severity of the problem. Only on News 4, Mark Seagraves introduces us to one of the new ambassadors and explains how this program will free up dozens of sworn officers for more serious issues. I'm a stakeholder in my community. I want to better my community. I want to be a part of that change that makes it better. And I also want to be that gap that bridged the um, police to the community. Davina Carson is one of 16 community safety ambassadors currently in training here at the D.C. Police Academy. D.C.'s Deputy Mayor for Public Safety tells News 4 once they hit the streets in a few weeks, these ambassadors will help with police duties like traffic and crowd control at big events or responding to low-level 911 calls like minor car crashes where a police report is needed but not an actual sworn officer. The things that we really um, believe that we can train civilians, right, these community safety ambassadors to respond to so that we can really free up sworn officers for the type of policing work that our community expects and needs from them. Carson has been a civilian employee for the D.C. Police Department for two years, but applied to be a safety ambassador as soon as she heard about the program. But not just because she wanted to be that bridge between the police and her community. I also have a 14-year-old son. I want him to feel safe. When he called the police, I want them to be able to show. 
Roderick Milstead oversees the ambassador program and tells News 4 once fully staffed, it will free up 46 sworn police officers to be on the streets full time. When we get full capacity, we should have 40 uh, CSIs, four supervisors, and uh, 20 of these pretty uh, uh, patrol or not patrol cars, 20 CSA cars patrolling the city. Carson hopes the community will embrace the safety ambassadors once they hit the streets. I want them to know that we're here to help. We're here to make a, the community better and to also bridge the gap between the community and MPD, you know, and to free them up so they can be arrived on the scene in a timely manner. In the district, Mark Seagraves, News 4. The current group of community safety ambassadors range in age from 24 to 65, and the department is still looking to hire even more. Right now, 11 D.C. students from at-risk communities are about to leave for a retreat to Ghana. They're set to leave Dulles Airport this evening, and it's all part of a cultural immersion program from a local nonprofit, Tumani, D.C. They'll be working with partner schools in Ghana to participate in service learning opportunities while exploring local history and traditions. And the experience is not just for students. And this is a multi-generational retreat. Um, there are parents joining us, grandparents joining us, and local community leaders and educators, a group of 26, going to Ghana to experience the culture um, and to just um, serve in the schools and embark on such an immersive experience today. Hope in Swahili in this program is described as giving marginalized youth an opportunity for personal growth. Hmm. What a cool opportunity and what an amazing adventure that will be. It'll be a, a lifetime of memories for them. Absolutely. Absolutely remember that forever. All right, coming up next here on The Rundown, a local woman bought a used car from a private seller online, but after she made payments for more than a year, her vehicle was repossessed from her driveway. We'll explain how title washing works and the consumer warning you need to know before you purchase a vehicle from a private seller. Plus, a controversial bike lane project in the district is dead. For now, it seems the district has mixed plans for protected bike lanes along Connecticut Avenue. How people living along the corridor are reacting to the news. Coming up. We're back with a warning now. If you're thinking about buying a used car from a private seller, a Virginia woman says she found herself in a financial mess after she discovered the seller lied about the vehicle. What happened next? Well, it left this unsuspecting buyer with the burden of an outstanding debt that she didn't even know she had until it was too late. Consumer investigative reporter Susan Hogan is about to take us to school, too, with a warning of things you need to know. You can buy just about anything on platforms like Facebook Marketplace, eBay, and Craigslist. But how do you know you're getting the whole truth from the seller? It was a kind of a dream come true. Barbara Aboji from Woodbridge thought she had hit the jackpot. So I saw this car. It's a 2015 Porsche Macan, and um, I love it. There it was. Barbara's dream car for $25,000 listed on Facebook Marketplace by a private seller from Pennsylvania. The two arranged to meet, and according to Barbara, the seller handed her a clean title, meaning there were no liens on the car, and he owned it outright. She then secured a loan with her bank. The seller got his check. She got her car. For 19 months, Barbara said she's been paying down her loan and hasn't missed a payment. And in fact, you even said that you actually pay double sometimes? Yes, ma'am. But this joyride came to a screeching halt when in early spring, she looked out the window and noticed her beloved Porsche was gone. I was like, oh my God, what is going on? Is this stolen? She was even more confused when she called police and they told her it wasn't stolen. It was actually repossessed. I said, what is going on? How come? Barbara's bank told her they didn't repossess the car and confirmed she was current on her payments. So if her bank didn't order the repo, who did? Barbara contacted NBC4 Response after she said no one could give her a straight answer for weeks. I've talked to you over a month. So we went to Barbara's house to see if we could get to the bottom of this. She gathered all of her paperwork for us. Well, I called because you guys took my car and started calling back all of the parties involved. Okay, where is the car? After several hours and several phone calls later, we finally got our answer. 
It was still under somebody else's name when it got repossessed. Turns out the car was still under the seller's name. That's right, the same name on that supposed clean title she was given. We understand you sold a 2015 Porsche Macan. NBC4 responds, did a little digging on our own. We learned the seller purchased the Porsche from Carvana back in 2020 and financed it through Bridgecrest, which is Carvana's finance company. And according to them, he was delinquent on paying back the loan on the Porsche. In fact, in 2022, Bridgecrest tells us he only made three payments on the car. And when they went to repossess the vehicle, they had no idea that he fraudulently sold it. And you called the guy that you bought the car from. Correct. What did he say to you? So the car was paid for. Bridgecrest tells News 4 it's now working with law enforcement to understand what occurred and the unlawful actions the seller took to fraudulently sell the vehicle for which he never paid. And since Barbara was able to purchase and register the car unknowingly using a fraudulent title, the vehicle identification number was linked to her home address. And that's where the tow truck was sent to repo it. I'm shocked. It, I'm speechless. I hear stories and stuff like that, but I never knew I'll be a victim one day. The person who sold uh, the consumer uh, the car clearly was the person who committed the fraud. Ira Ringold is the director of the National Association of Consumer Advocates. He says title washing is the most common scam for vehicle titles. It's when unscrupulous sellers wash a title to remove information like liens or salvage. Fraudsters are out there. They're always looking to take advantage of folks. But this journey fortunately had a happy ending. Even though Barbara's repossessed dream car had been sent to an auction house where it was about to go on the auction block, both Carvana and Bridgecrest agreed to release the car so Barbara could take it home. And we were there when she did. It was a good day for Barbara when she was finally back behind the wheel. I feel so relieved, super happy. I can't thank you guys enough. I am so grateful. We contacted the seller numerous times, but he never responded to any of our questions. Now, as for Bridgecrest, they told NBC4 that they contacted several law enforcement agencies but haven't heard back from any of them. And as of now, they have not pursued any civil action against the seller. And to protect yourself from title fraud, when buying a car from a private seller, experts say ask for a photo ID and compare the names on the title to make sure they actually match. If the title is a duplicate, be wary and ask more questions like, where is the original and can I see it? And get a Carfax report. If it shows it was salvaged, the title should reflect that. And if it doesn't, you may want to walk away from the sale. Back to you. How frustrating. Wow, yeah. But the and good a happy ending. She got a car back. Yeah, exactly. All right, got some bad news. DC bike riders, we learned that bike lanes will not be included along the redesigned section of Connecticut Avenue in North West Northwest, at least not for now. This has been a controversial issue, to say the least, for years. The tentative answer came from D.C.'s Department of Transportation Director during a council hearing uh, yesterday. The plan for a nearly three miles protected bike lane would have taken away a travel lane and parking and also changed bus stops and loading zones. Cycling advocates call it an issue of safety, but so do those who oppose the bike lanes. I really don't think we have enough bikers to support protected bike lanes. I don't know what the solution is for that, but I don't think it's bike lanes. The Washington Area Bicyclist Association, or WABA, has vowed to keep up their lobbying efforts to create a safer option for bike riders. Meanwhile, the group Save Connecticut Avenue, which opposed the lanes, thanked city officials for their decision to cancel that project. Mm. All right, still to come on the rundown, celebrating a generation of women who broke barriers and kept the country running during World War II. I'm so excited for this. We're talking about Rosie the Riveter. Dozens of Rosies gathered in D.C. for a very special ceremony. How their hard work is being recognized decades later. All right, we made it to Friday, which means it is time to start ironing out your weekend plans. And there are plenty of things to do in our region. You can celebrate DC's emancipation or learn all about Japanese culture on the National Mall or even see a play about artificial intelligence. Tommy has it all in the weekend scene. 
DC's Emancipation Day is special at home and also significant across the country. On April 16th, 1862, President Lincoln ended slavery in the district, eight and a half months before the Emancipation Proclamation. And Sunday's celebration steps off with a parade. It will kick off at 2 p.m. at 10th and Pennsylvania Avenue. At 3 p.m., Mayor Bowser will host her annual Emancipation Day concert, and you don't want to miss any part of it. From Jata Freeman singing Lift Every Voice and Sing, Genuine will be back home. You can bring your kids. We're going to have moon bounces. We're just going to have a funky, good, free family fun time on Emancipation Day at Freedom Plaza. Plus, Cherry Blossom season is coming to a close and it's got a big send off Saturday and Sunday. Speaking of Pennsylvania Avenue, one of the biggest celebrations of Japanese culture in the U.S. stretches blocks on Pennsylvania. The Sakura Matsuri Festival has handmade Japanese crafts, food, cultural performances, and so much more. Head to Adams Morgan to get your steps in. The Art Walk is underway. Along your walk through the beautiful neighborhood, you're gonna find really unique, beautiful art displays from 20 different local artists. And there's so much to be said about AI and what our relationship with technology will be in the future. Leave it to Rorschach Theater to create a thought-provoking and immersive show in a former retail space. Human Museum is a brand new play written by Miyoko Connolly, and uh, it is about a group of robots who are running a museum about humanity. At Connecticut and K Street, step into an experience 100 years after humans. You'll get to uh, explore our museum shop. There is uh, an exhibit about some of the foods that might have survived the apocalypse that you can experience up here. It's going to be so weird to see like a museum show about AI. no more humans. Uh, well, I mean, yeah, it's scary because, yeah. you know, there have been movies about That's right. it, but, you know, we're moving in that direction. And the Rorschach Theater does such cool immersive stuff. You go into a two-floor former retail space at mm -hmm. Connecticut and K, and mm -hmm. they, they, they just turn the whole thing into this awesome local production. It's really cool. Got to go check it out. Mm -hmm. All right. I'm super stoked about this, too. 150 students from across the country are in the district to showcase their innovations created to solve everyday problems. That's right. It's all part of the first ever National STEM Festival put on by the U.S. Department of Education. Students from right here in our region and all across the country submitted their projects to the competition. This weekend, they will be presenting their ideas to the public. So I actually think it's very important for medical advancements and healthcare advancements because technology is emerging very fast, um, whether it's VR, artificial intelligence, blockchain technology, and these are the things that are going to help us be more efficient in our healthcare industry. Some of the students already have patents pending on their projects. They hope that one day their ideas will help save or improve lives at home and around the world. Patents pending in high school. Love to see it. <laughs> They're good. They're, mm -hmm. they're the future leaders of our world. All right. Speaking of leaders, a big moment in D.C. this week for Rosie the Riveter. The women who stepped up to work in the factories during World War II finally received the nation's highest civilian honor. News First, Ariel Hickson was on Capitol Hill when more than 25 Rosies celebrated their long-awaited recognition. Decades later, and these women are finally getting their flowers. I'm overwhelmed with the attention that we're getting after 80 years. <laughs> Today, those flowers look more like this, the Congressional Gold Medal, Congress's highest civilian honor. I'm very excited about that because I didn't expect it after all this time. You may recognize them from this iconic image, Rosie the Riveter. I worked on the B-25. The B-25 is a very large plane. Back in World War II, they entered the workforce to support the United States while men were fighting abroad. My only thing thought was to get those boys home. Today, they range in age from 80 to... Oh, 106, and I'll be 107 in May. Their work as silent warriors forever changed the American workforce and inspired generations and generations of women. Originally, there were more than 6 million Rosies. Decades later, only 25 are here in person. We're representing the whole group. And that, uh, I'm sorry, the other people can't, ha can't have had it in their lifetime. But their presence, strength, and determination defies the odds and leaves us with one final message. Remember these four little words, we can do it. <laughs>
On Capitol Hill, Ariel Hickson, NBC Washington. What a great way to go into the weekend. They are just so incredible. I love seeing it. One woman, she's going to be 107. By the way, doesn't look it. But no. just think of the life that they've lived and the history they've seen. Mm -hmm. And I'm so glad they're being recognized. The work they've done, six million of them over the years. Mm -hmm. It should have happened more than, you know, after 80 years. Yeah. But yeah. wow, what a great thing. Glad they're for... getting their flowers. Totally. Totally. Ah, gives you all the feels as you start your Friday night. Yes, it does, Tom. Seriously, I, this, I'm just, I, way to go, Rosies. In a world of everyone else, be a Rosie the Riveter, and that'll do it for the News 4 Rundown. Thanks for joining us. I'm Tommy McFly. I'm Sean Yancey. We're going to see you back here tomorrow. That's what they did, right? Is that what they, yeah, that's they what did? They, that's what they did. Uh, we'll see you Monday. Yeah. Have a great weekend, everybody.